Now in the next month or so, I'm going to turn a number of bowls and I'll put up some videos. This particular piece of wood is Australian willow. It's rather soft, but it, uh, it's got some nice uh, grain in it. And I'm going to turn this bowl in this video today. I'm going to complete it in one go. I'm going to green turn it. Okay, I'm not going to rough turn it and let it dry. So we'll kind of cover some of the issues concerned with that. So uh, other issues with this piece of wood, I've got uh, a knot right here or a pith. Uh, I've got another one right here. And I've also got one on the very bottom. Now, that could mean that it's going to crack and we'll have to find out how that works. It also could mean that it's going to warp kind of funky and maybe have some interesting grain in it. Let's go over the lathe and get started on this bowl. Now let me show you the way I'm going to attach this bowl blank to my lathe. I've got my Vicmark chuck onto my Powermatic. I suspect the jaws open up to maybe five inches or something. I'm going to have a compression spigot on the piece of wood. I've got a screw chuck that comes with this Vicmark chuck and I think just about any chuck you buy anymore will have some sort of a screw. Tighten that down very well. And this is really my favorite way of attaching a bowl blank to my lathe. Now, word of caution here. I'm going to show you the way I do this. Doesn't mean you have to do this. And I, I got a comment from somebody that said, well, this is probably kind of dangerous. I'm not sure if it's all that dangerous or not, but I'm going to turn my lathe on and I'm going to just uh, screw this piece of wood on while the lathe is turning. This screw right here sticks out a good inch and a quarter from this surface right here. I'm not going to bring my tailstock up. Probably the worst thing that could happen is I strip this out and the piece of wood is just going to spin on there. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, in drilling the hole, here's another bit of information. This screw thread right here is probably three-eighths of an inch. I've got a really small drill hole on that. It's probably a quarter of an inch. This is really wet wood and it's going to compress and I can get it on there, but drilling a smaller hole will uh, make, make the fixing a lot more secure. If I were turning a dry piece of wood, that uh, hole would be closer to the diameter of my thread. So here I go and I'll probably get emails about this from the safety police, but uh, turn my lathe on about as slow as it'll go. And that's about as slow as it'll go. I'm going to line that hole up. And I need to put a little bit of pressure on that so the threads will start. And I'm going to turn my lathe off right here. Okay, now I've got a little bit of a gap back here that you can't see. All right, that's better. I readjusted my camera. So there's a gap right here. I didn't go all the way. It's on there. I'm going to lock my spindle and I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to screw this on the rest of the way by hand. And when I drilled that hole, I was, uh, you know, certain to drill that deep enough to take the entire thread. And there it is. That's pretty good. Let me readjust my camera and I'll get a tool and we'll go to work on this. Now, as you can tell, this bowl blank is really, really out of balance. And I think the first thing I'm going to do is level off this bottom and establish my spigot. In case this screw strips out, I can simply reverse that into my chuck. And yes, I'm wearing a face shield.
Now, as I prepare to turn my spigot on this large piece of wood, I've got my calipers marked with the dimension of my larger Vic Mark chuck. I'm just marking that with a pencil. And I'll start defining where that spigot is going to be with a parting tool right here. Just kind of mark that into the wood. And then the upcoming clips, I'll take different tools and hog away the wood from the left side of that and just uh, start forming that spigot. It's going to be a compression fixing. And here I've got my larger three quarter inch bowl gouge and that's really good for taking off a lot of wood very quickly. Okay, so far so good. I've gotten that down to a point where I can establish my spigot. I've got that measured on there. I'm going to find a different tool, a smaller tool, and complete this. Now I have a 3 8 inch bowl gouge and I'm going to complete this uh, spigot on here. I'm going to need to raise my tool rest just a little bit. All right, now I have my spigot or my tenon completed. I finished it off with a point tool because I really like to get in there at that angle. And I think the angle of that point tool is pretty similar to the jaws on my chuck. Now the depth of this is going on to a half an inch, probably shy of a half an inch, but that's the depth also of my my large Vicmark jaws. So I'm all ready to reverse this. I could reverse this right now. What I'm going to do while it's in this position, I'm going to work on leveling this off and doing a little bit on this surface right here. And my fixing is good. It's vibrating a little bit, but uh, that's a lot of weight for that uh, that screw. And several times I've, I've stopped my lathe and made sure that, that that's on there very well, and I've also retightened my my chuck jaws. And that's a good idea. Now, I don't recommend this procedure for everybody. I think you have to be a little bit more experienced to do this. I don't like to bring up my tailstock because it weighs a lot, and I can do this without the tailstock. So let me just do a little bit more work on this, and then I'll reverse that and put it into my chuck jaws. Now right here I'm truing up this surface with a smaller bowl gouge and the area that I'm working on has been trued up. It's level and flat and I can rub my bevel going back into my, my spigot right here. Now as I work on leveling out the bottom of this bowl, on the very left side there, along the edge of the bowl, right here, there it's a good shot, you can really see that out of balance area. And part of it's out of balance and not trued up, and part of it is. And as I continue to work around that, you'll see how I address that. Right now I've got this bowl gouge pretty much in a scraping orientation. And as I go around there, I'll change from a scrape to a cut right here. And uh, I'll try to rub that bevel as much as I can. And eventually I get the surface trued up and I'm able to do that all along the uh, side of that very large bowl.
Now, please keep in mind this is part one of a two-part series. And as I start editing this video, there are 35 or 40 minutes of footage. And this is only a small part of what I have in terms of time I'm spending on this. I'm probably taking four hours, five hours to complete this. So there's a lot of footage, and I think there's a lot of good uh, shots of uh, tool work, like right here. So I'm just going back and forth in different directions. And here I'm up near the rim of the bowl. I'm going to try to true up the entire side of this bowl, and then very shortly I'll reverse this, and you'll see the profile. Now right now I have the camera readjusted so you can see the profile of this hollow form slash bowl taking shape. Here I'm going to take a scraper and sort of uh, work on that shape a little bit. Now this particular piece started out as a bowl and then I changed my mind and thought well gee I might as well just make uh, a hollow form out of this. So right now it's a hollow form. And as you can see, I'm still in my screw chuck, and on the left side is the spigot. And it's really holding very well. And this is how I like to uh, put a piece on my lathe with a screw chuck and just work as long as I can, because then I have total access to the bottom and all the way around the side of this particular piece. I can uh, access that with my tools. Okay, time out. Now, as I complete the outside of this bowl, I'm gonna make an executive decision. I'm gonna turn this bowl into a hollow form. I've got some issues to deal with, and I've got a knot right here. I've got a knot right there, which may be the pith, I'm not sure. I've got one on the very bottom. And I've also got a pretty substantial crack right here. So whatever I do, I'm going to have to take a majority of this wood off up here to eliminate these voids. So I think what I'll do is reverse chuck this and take this area down, just make a hollow form out of this. That's okay. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to green turn this. I'm going to finish it as it's wet. And it may just be a little bit on the funky side, you know, and that's okay. It'll warp and maybe there'll be some cracks in it, which I can deal with and, and make a little bit more attractive later on. So let me do a little bit more profiling on this and then we'll start hollowing this form. I've got my vessel reversed into my chuck jaws and I've got a, a fairly large crack right here. And I'm gonna have to just kind of play it by ear whether I leave that in there or remove it. it, goes from about here all the way around to here. And I can certainly turn that away, but I'd like to keep as much of this uh, vessel intact. I'm going to do a little bit of scraping. There's quite a bit of really, really fuzzy grain on this. This is Australian willow. It's uh, fairly pretty wood, but it's, uh, it's pretty soft. So let me do a little bit of turning. And what I'm using here is a, an old bowl gouge that I've got ground with some really, really long wings. And I'm gonna just do a little bit of shear scraping on this. Now I have some badly torn grain right along here and I'm going to work on that right now.
Now you can't see my tool right now, but you can certainly see that line on the right side of the hollow form right here progressing to the uh, chuck as I make that cut. And I like to use this time on a large piece like this just for practice. I'm making some cuts and scrapes and different uh, approaches with different tools. And I just like to use this time. It's not a finishing cut by any means, but I like to use this uh, opportunity just to practice. And usually it's all practice right up until you make that final cut. Now here are some good shots of some tool work as I progress up toward the top of this hollow form. And in one or two upcoming clips, I'll show you a close-up of this particular uh, cut with this large bowl gouge. And what I'm using is a back cut. That's something Richard Raffin used to uh, refer to. And I've got the flute of this tool almost completely open using the very left side of the tool to make the cut. It's a little bit risky. You have to have a firm grip on your tool so it doesn't uh, grab on you and catch that left wing. Right here is a close-up of this uh, cut I'm talking about. And you can see where the wood is coming off the tool. And again, that flute is almost completely open. It's a sheer cut. It's about as clean as a cut you're going to get with a gouge like this. Now, eventually, I take off all this wood because I've got that crack to deal with. But, again, I'm practicing. All right, now, I have nothing against bowling balls, except I just don't want this to look quite like I'm trying to pick up a 710 split here. Anyway... I like the form that's developing here. I need to take a little bit more off right here. What I need to do right now is to set up my stabilizer and my hollowing uh, tools and do a little bit of hollowing on this. I can always come back to the outside of this later. But I like where this is going. Well, it's time to regroup a little bit. I'm not sure what I've shown you so far in this video. I started out making a bowl, and then after I rounded this piece off, I thought that would be a good hollow form. Well, I had a little accident this morning, and my hollow form went back to maybe a bowl. So there's the lid. Now, I've been using Trent Bosch's stabilizer now on my stabilizer, I've also got uh, a laser hooked up and I was doing most of that except I couldn't reach this part of the rim. So I went to a curve tool and I didn't have it hooked up to my laser and my stabilizer. So there's a shout out to Trent Bosch and the stabilizer. And the only time I've ever gone through a wall such as this is when I'm not using my stabilizer with the lasers. So anyway, I think what I'm going to do at this point, I'm going to make a Beads of Courage container. So I'm going to finish up uh, with the wall thickness here, making that even all the way through, and I'll put a lid on this, and it'll be a great box or a container for some kid in a hospital. Beads of Courage. Okay. Okay, I've got my camera and my laser readjusted. And if you can see this right here, this is the laser mark right here. And I'm and my cutting point is a little bit behind that. So it's about right there. I'm going to turn my my lathe on.
Okay, so this line right here is the cutting tip of my tool. And I can go down just a little bit farther. I'm, I'm really thick in here. Plus, when it comes down to it, I can use this tenon or spigot as part of my uh, depth of my bowl. So I'm going to come down a little bit farther on that very bottom. Okay, I'm going to check my wall thickness and I think I'm good there. The only thing I need to decide at this point is whether I put this away and dry it or finish turn it right now. Alright, now I'm taking a Robert Sorby scraper. I like this tool but I can't always get it into my my hollow forms because it's rather wide but something like this it's a great tool to you. So I'm just leveling off the surface in here, making it a little smoother, and I'll do some sanding. And then I'll decide what I'm going to do next on this vessel. Now partly what I'm doing is I'm taking off the high spots inside this because once I get this completed you can certainly reach your hand in there and feel all the imperfections. Now, now this is a very nice tool. However, if I leave this tool flat like this, I'm likely to get a catch because there's a lot of uh, cutting edge right there contacting the wood. So what I'm doing is I'm angling this tool a little bit like that, which makes it a little bit safer to use and less aggressive. I'm going to do a little bit more work on that, do some sanding, and one thing I'll do is trim up this uh, opening right here because it's pretty ragged. Now this wood is still really wet, but I think it's important to do a little bit of uh, sanding on this rim because I'm going to have to put a lid in there to complete my project. My wall thickness I would estimate to be about 3 eighths of an inch thick. I've got that smoothed out pretty well. I'm going to do a little bit of sanding off camera and uh, then we'll move ahead from there. Now I think a good way to learn how to do a hollow form is to make a piece similar to the one I'm working on right now. It's got a very, very wide opening and I'm measuring the wall thickness. You can see everything you're doing pretty much and it's a lot easier to turn a piece like this than a hollow form with a one inch opening. So I'm making sure the wall thickness is pretty even all the way down. I'm marking a place where it gets a little bit thick. Now this shop made measuring device that I'm showing you right here is made from 3 16 inch wire I got from Ace Hardware. It works really, really well. 
and you can kind of see how that's made right here. Now the shape of this thickness gauge allows me to measure any area on this uh, closed form and all I have to do is just turn it over and I can get down to the very bottom. Now I'm back to my stabilizing tool and you can maybe make out that uh, laser light on the side of the vessel. I'll show you a close-up of that in a second. And this is good practice uh, for using this. And again, as I said, it's got a very large opening, which makes the hollowing a lot easier. Now, and there's that close-up I promised you. And as that laser light gets a little bit closer to the uh, wall thickness I'm looking for, it becomes more oval, and eventually it'll uh, disappear. And that's where I... Uh, no, I'm at the right wall thickness I've set on my stabilizing tool. Now it's been a while since I started this project with this piece of Australian willow. It's going to end up as a Beads of Courage container and I'm going to make a two-part video series out of this project. This is going to be part one and what I'm going to do eventually is I'm going to put the metal reactive verde paint on this. This wood is really not very pretty. It's a little bit ugly. I've got some cracks here that I'm going to have to fill. Uh, as this wood dries, these are opening up. So I can fill those and cover all this up with that verde paint. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer. It's still fairly wet. I can just feel the moisture. I've had that packed away in some shavings, so I'm going to continue to let it dry. It may be another three or four weeks before I can really finish this, take the, the spigot off the bottom. It's still a little bit thick down here. So that's video one. Now it's probably been six weeks since I started turning this particular piece. It's going to be a Beads of Courage container. It's nice and large. In part two, I'm going to show you how I did this lid, and I'm very happy with that. I think it's going to be a very nice contrast with the base of this large container. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this base in Verde Metal Reactive Paint. And I've been experimenting lately when I do the Verde paint. I put a base coat on it that's really not related to the to the process of the Verde paint. But you can put red, green, black, whatever you want as a base coat, put the Verde paint on it, and let some of that green, in this case, show through. So that's what I'm gonna do. I've got f quite a few blemishes on this that I'm gonna try to hide with that paint. And I think that's a good uh, use of that paint sometimes when you have a piece that's really not all that pretty. Here's and you can see from this profile that this is really warped, kind of like a football. So the next thing you see will be this completed piece going into part two. I'll do the lid and I'll show you the, uh, the final result with the base of this and the metal reactive paint applied to it.